I think we have to go on with the program and go to the next speaker, who is Igor Kibanov from Princeton, uh, who is going to talk about two-dimensional gauge theory with the adjoint matter. So Igor, please go ahead. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much, Lars. Uh, yeah, I should say that this was an especially difficult uh, talk to follow. It kind of reminds us that some things are transient and some things are eternal. And uh, it's a special honor for me to be speaking at the, at the centenary conference for Andrei Dmitrievich Sakharov, uh, who of course I heard uh, a lot about since my childhood. Um, so let me switch to much smaller things. Uh, uh, two-dimensional gauge theory with a joint matter. <clears throat> I hope you can see my slides. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so the talk will be based on a fairly recent paper with uh, my colleague at Princeton, Silvio Pufu, and uh, graduate student Ross Dempsey. Uh, but before I launched, uh, launch into the actual paper and the model, I want to talk a bit about the setting of the problem. <clears throat> Uh, basically talk somewhat broadly about the problem of color confinement and QCD, which continues to be an unsolved problem and a very deep problem in theoretical physics. Uh, there has been great progress in lattice gauge theory, uh, where uh, there is a lot of numerical evidence for confinement and mass gap in QCD, but there's still no quantitative analytic understanding of these phenomena. <laughs> At the same time, uh, there has been progress in physics of hadrons. Uh, in particular, the, over the past 10 years, there have been discoveries of these mysterious molecular type states of mesons, which are sometimes called tetraquarks. Uh, and the, uh, the first and rather striking example is this charmonium state X called X3872. Basically, it weighs uh, 3.872 GV. And uh, a remarkable thing about this number is that it's very close to the sum of the mass of the D meson and D star meson. So it appears to be a kind of threshold molecular state, uh, which is still uh, somewhat mysterious. And part of the reason I bring it up is uh, that I'll encounter certain threshold states and the uh, a toy model that, that I will be discussing. Uh, I should say that uh, this uh, workshop generally is called Quarks 2021. And uh, uh, while this, uh, this particular talk is a bit off topic compared to some others, but I will actually be mentioning Quarks. That's one of the advantage, uh, one of the special things about my talk. Uh, so let me just remind you that uh, there are these clay millennium problems which appeared in the year 2000, about 21 years ago. And one of them is Young Mills and mass gap, basically asking to prove uh, that there is a mass gap, namely that there are no free gluons, no free quarks uh, in quantum versions of Young Mills equations and status is unsolved. Uh, and there is a price tag of 1 million uh, maybe this should be adjusted upwards because of, uh, since now people are talking in trillions uh, in terms of budgets, but, um, but we're not in this field for money, of course. So uh, it would be a fantastic development to actually prove, prove some of these things. And right around the same time, uh, one of my favorite strings conference, uh, conferences was in Michigan in 2000. And there was a similar phenomenon. People were asked to propose problems for the next millennium, which were then carefully selected by Mike Duff, David Gross, and uh, Edward Witten. And coming in, uh, just squeaking in as number 10 was the same question that I proposed and independently Taffiard, who I guess since then left the field. Basically, can we quantitatively understand quark and gluon confinement in QCD? Uh, so just uh, the setting of the problem, we of course all know about lattice gauge theory. Uh, <clears throat> basically, you, you have a sum over these uh, plaquette terms. Uh, just one second. Uh, 
Um, so we, we have these, uh, these plaquette. Oops. Yeah, so you can see, for example, the big Wilson loop. The idea is to prove the area law for the Wilson loop. That's equivalent to the linear potential between quark and antiquark. And then strong coupling expansion in plaquette terms, this is rather trivial. Basically, one has to tile, uh, tile the entire Wilson loop with these elementary plaquettes. And then one finds in this strong coupling expansion that the expectation value of the Wilson loop is e to the minus the area times some function of young Mills coupling. Uh, but uh, this is in the limit when G is taken to be large at, in the UV. But of course, because of the asymptotic freedom, we need to extrapolate to small young Mills coupling in the UV. And the big question is, can confinement disappear in the process of this extrapolation? And numerical simulations indicate that the answer is no, but so far there is no analytic proof. But uh, let me just show you a fairly old picture from uh, lattice gauge theory. You have probe, quark, and anti-quark. And as you stretch them, you really see that there is some action density in between. Uh, you can see this famous uh, confining flux tube uh, appearing and, uh, and its width does not depend strongly on the separation between quarks. So this is very different from the short distance behavior where you have the Coulombic potential. And this type of confining flux tube appears at quark anti-quark distances of more than one uh, femtometer. So at least uh, this is an observation of a confining string and uh, it's not to obey approximately the number gotta area action, but uh, there are some corrections that people are studying. So it continues to be a very active field. And uh, now um, there is of course the large end limit, uh, which has been very fruitful uh, where you extend the, the number of colors from three to N uh, and this has the advantage that even when there are dynamical quarks, uh, the flux tube will remain stable because the probability of, flux, of, of uh, snapping the flux tube for quark anti quark per creation is suppressed by one over n. And another advantage of the large n limit is that we can have dual descriptions, for example, for the n equal four supersymmetric version of Young Mills theory. We know that it's dual to string theory on anti sitter space times a sphere. Uh, this uh, we've been hearing about for many years now, so I won't dwell on it. Uh, and this description uh, allows one to study what goes on at very strong uh, young mills Hoft coupling G squared N. Uh, and one, one interesting thing, so what have we learned about confinement from these types of models? Well, in the conformal models, which are dual to ADS5, uh, the way one studies the quark anti quark potential is by studying the classical string that stretch bends into the anti sitter space and connects quark and anti quark at the boundary of anti sitter space. And then, one, because of uh, conformal invariance, one finds, uh, as well, the center first found that there is a Coulombic potential. But the coefficient, instead of the familiar lambda at weak coupling, becomes square root lambda at strong coupling. So there is a kind of interpolation between the two that actually has been understood uh, through the methods of exact integrability. But this obviously is not the confining behavior. It continues to be colomic at, uh, up until strong coupling. Uh, so what does one have to do to see confinement? Well, there can be, there are backgrounds where there is a kind of infrared wall, uh, which you see here, then the string does not, uh, is not self-similar. Once it reaches the wall, it kind of uh, lies down and stretches along the wall. And this becomes the confining string. It does not lose its tension and one rather simply sees the, uh, the linear potential between quark and anti-quark. And this has been also studied in many, many papers. Uh, so this is a kind of toy model, five-dimensional toy model. There are also 10-dimensional models where this happens. Uh, for example, the model that uh, Matt Strassler and I, uh, uh, following the work with Arkady Zaitlin and uh, Nick Krasov. 
<laughs> actually appeared right around the time of the Millennium Conference, uh, Strings 2000. So here, one actually has an exact string background dual to a confining theory. It has a very simple warped product form of a, a deformed conifold, Calabria space and three plus one dimensional uh, space, which is our dimensions. Uh, then in this background, one can just, again, classically compute uh, the quark anti-quark potential using the same method of finding the classical solution for the Nambugota string. And, uh, and you find that it indeed interpolates between Coulombic behavior at short distances and linear potential at long distances. So this is uh, just like what we want to see in QCD, but seen in a very simple toy model. And just for comparison, I'm showing the picture what one sees on the lattice. This is already a quite old plot, but uh, it follows pretty closely the phenomenological Cornell potential, which is the sum of Coulombic and linear terms. Uh, so, so this is uh, a bit of good news, but it's certainly not uh, the solution of the problem because so the, the issue is that this theory is not asymptotically free, unlike QCD. This, uh, this particular theory uh, ex uh, stays strongly coupled in the UV and has a different type of uh, RG flow. So uh, we don't know how to see confinement in asymptotically free theories using this uh, gauge string duality. Uh, and this remains a very big problem for the future. Uh, so now let me just drop back to one plus one dimensional gauge theories uh, where one can, uh, which in some sense are much older than these gauge string dual duality models and see what goes on there, uh, whether confinement is trivial there or not. Of course, in one, one spatial dimension, you can say that confinement is rather trivial because just perturbatively you see the linear potential between quark and anti-quark. But here we actually can find a, an interesting surprise that there are models that actually are not confining. And this is uh, the main topic of my talk. Uh, so let me remind you of the classic Toft model, uh, which, uh, Toft, uh, which is basically the copy of QCD, but one in one plus one dimensions. And you have just NF fermions, namely NF uh, quarks and the fund, uh, NF fermions in the fundamental, namely NF quarks. One takes the large end limit, keeping NF here uh, just of order one. Uh, so what Hoft realizes is that the model is exactly solvable in the large end limit using the light cone gauge. And this is the famous Hoft equation, these alpha one and alpha two are related to the mass squared of quark and anti-quark. One can has special values where they're actually zero. And then there is this uh, inter singular integral equation which governs the masses of mesons. One finds then the single Reggie trajectory of, uh, of mesons. And this is a plot from Toft's original 1974 paper. For m equals zero, the first meson is actually massless. And the remaining are, uh, ones are massive. And then you see how this evolves as one dials up the quark mass. Uh, so this uh, model is of course very famous and has been studied in thousands of papers, but uh, it's not ideal for describing the physics of higher dimensional QCD because there are really no locally joined degrees of freedom. One can essentially integrate out the gluons, they give a kind of Coulombic potential. So because of this issue, uh, already many years ago, more than 30 years ago, people started looking at models where you by hand add, uh, by hand, uh, add some adjoint matter to the model. And in particular, Simon Daly and I in 1992 looked at a similar method to Toft, namely light cone quantization. Uh, and that model is much, much harder to solve, the one with a joint. Uh, so one specific model that we considered was with an adjoint Majorana fermion, which is a kind of toy gluino. It has some very nice uh, properties. The mass is actually, uh, it's a basically finite model. Uh, the mass is protected against renormalization by a discrete chiral symmetry. Uh, you see this mass term. So in particular, there is a very special point where the mass is zero and there is no mass term at all. 
and there are really no UV divergences, just like in the OFT model. Uh, this uh, SUN model has interesting topological structure, which already was noted by Witten from way before in 1979. Namely, it has a kind of discrete analog of four dimensional theta vacua because one can just add some number of quarks, say k quarks at, an, at uh, infinity and corresponding k anti quarks at minus infinity. And the number k can range from zero, which is a trivial vacuum to n minus one. And because, uh, and then they form a kind of string uh, spanning the entire space. And one can study the energies of these different uh, theta vacua uh, in presence of the joint uh, fields only. Basically, since there are no dynamical quarks, there is no way to, uh, to snap this flux tube and this gives different topological sectors. Uh, we will be primarily working in, in the sector with k equals zero, because that's the one that's the easiest to study. But we will actually soon add by hand the, the massive quarks to study the quark anti quark potential. Uh, so now, if you just take the model with this adjoint Majorana, uh, it already has an interesting surprise, it turns out. that. Uh, when the mass of the quark is zero, the mass of the joint is zero, one can compute uh, the infrared central charge. This is a so-called gauge WZW model. Uh, and one basically has to subtract the central charge of the numerator uh, and the central charge of the denominator and they exactly cancel. So the infrared model has vanishing central charge, which means that the light as bound state is massive. So, this model, one can just prove that there is a mass gap, but there is a really surprising phenomenon that the Wilson loop in fundamental representation actually does not exhibit the area law. Uh, and this uh, was argued in a couple of papers in 94, 95, in particular a paper by uh, David Gross, uh, Andrei Matitz and, uh, and Andrei Smilga, uh, which was called screening versus confinement. And then more recently, some uh, modern techniques have been applied to this problem with basically the same conclusion by Kamargotsky and collaborators. And uh, then in this paper that we wrote that I'll talk about in a second, we had some uh, more, another way to see the same phenomenon. Uh, so let's just think about uh, <clears throat> uh, what the bound states look like. So uh, the, now, instead of the quark anti quark bound states that one sees in the Toft model, uh, which are a bit like open strings, here one sees closed string like states uh, where, where you have uh, K1, K2, K3, these are all longitudinal momenta K. Plus. Uh, and, uh, and then there is just some light cone wave function that averages over these states. But the hard part is that the states say with uh, N such. Uh, bits can mix with states with n plus two and n minus two bits. So there is, unlike in the Toft model case where there is just a two body equation, here you have a mixing of uh, all different sectors. And this is uh, not possible to solve exactly. Uh, yet uh, one can, so what, what did we do already starting 92, 93? We applied the so-called uh, DLCQ method the discretized light cone quantization, uh, which is a kind of regulator method. We formally assign anti-periodic boundary conditions to, to this uh, adjoint fermion field around the circle with a minus sign. Uh, this makes these, uh, these uh, k's basically half odd integer over L. L is just a formal parameter, which at the end cancels out of everything. Uh, and then there is a total P plus, which is some odd integer uh, divided by 2L, other even integer. And uh, the nice uh, simplification from the large end limit is that the single trace Luina ball states don't mix with double trace states. So we basically make K some integer, the sum of these bit numbers has to add up to K. And then we look at the complete Hilbert space of, of these uh, 
these states and, and diagonalize the big matrix. That's, uh, so, so this uh, regulator method is rather well suited for this problem. Uh, the hard part is of course that, uh, so for even K, the closed string-like states are bosons and for odd K, they're fermions. Uh, and uh, so we need to carry out exact diagonalization. This is what condensed matter people call exact diagonalization. It means you get hold of a very powerful computer cluster and it can, you can get eigenvalues with very high precision. So back in 93, in the 90s, we diagonalized up to K equal 25 and the number of states maximum number of states was 6,712. Now with the help of Ross Dempsey, who is amazing with computers, we already diagonalized up to K equal 41, which is 9 million states. And one can actually do even better with uh, modern day techniques. But already here, one can see the physics pretty well. So, and, uh, so this is not actually, it turns out to be that there are some interesting phenomena here which are not just numerical. In particular, in the paper in 97 with David Gross and Aki Hashimoto, we noticed some peculiar degeneracies between states. And in particular, we observed certain threshold states. In particular, if you take the fermion, so the Z2 is just a string parity, uh, string world sheet parity quantum number. So in the fermion uh, Z2 even sector, uh, we saw that uh, there, uh, there was some uh, exact degeneracy between, uh, between what seems like uh, uh, still single string states and pairs of, of states. Okay, this is the equation straight from that paper. It basically says that while the ground state, uh, you see the mass gap very explicitly, there are some excited states that seem like they fall apart into pairs of such states. Uh, and uh, so now we understood these exact degeneracies better. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this was, uh, so here, for example, we, we by uh, orange dots, we denote, uh, we denote basically states that are exactly degenerate with just pairs of states or triples of states. And we see that there is some peculiar phenomenon where just what looks like a single string state is degenerate with a pair or some number of single string states. And this, uh, this one can show is actually an exact uh, degeneracy in this discretized light cone quantization. This completely depends on the mass of the joint being zero. As soon as you make, uh, make the spectrum uh, uh, make m bigger than zero, you see that these uh, continuous spectrum becomes gap. And, uh, and uh, the, the mass of a joint model is truly confining. So, you, so basically you see the appearance of this continuous spectrum, even in this, uh, um, uh, this model, and the continuous spectrum indicates that somehow the model is not really confining the closed strings and disintegrate. Okay, so, so I probably don't have time to explain this in much detail, but the underlying structure is the katz moody algebra or the current algebra. Basically one can uh, separate states into current blocks as pointed out by Kutasov and Schwimmer already in 94, 95. And, uh, and it turns out that the different current blocks don't mix with each other. Uh, and the light, this uh, Hamiltonian, like Cohn Hamiltonian of the QCD model, it just has this unusual structure with one over n squared, but it's completely diagonal uh, within this, these blocks. I mean, it, it doesn't mix different blocks together. And this is one of the secrets of this model that one can go to this cuts uh, basis, look at basically primaries and act with them on, uh, by current operators. And, uh, and this structure basically explains some exact, some of the exact degeneracy that are seen in the numerical diagonalization. Okay, so now just a few words about the new thing that we did, which is we added to this model with the joints also NF fundamental Dirac fermion. So this, now there are both mesonic states and uh, gluina ball-like states. 
But the mesons are much more complicated than in the Toft model because between the quark and antiquark, there can be some number of these adjoined quanta, which are shown schematically like this. And again, uh, the meson spectra will exhibit an infinite set of rigid trajectories. The meson spectrum also exhibits very interesting patterns of degeneracies. For example, certain states have identical P minus at different values of K. And, uh, uh, and this is due to some symmetry we identified, which is there in the large end limit. Uh, so again, you see that, uh, that there will be some kind of continuous spectrum of these uh, meson states that uh, starts at the same value of mass squared as the lightest uh, uh, Gluina ball light state. Uh, so, so then using this uh, approach, one can basically see that, uh, that there is no confinement. Uh, and we can, we can see it uh, very explicitly by looking at, for example, the model, uh, the spectrum of mesons. Essentially, the one of the arguments that we had in the 1995 paper is that uh, there are two, uh, there is this a joint model and then there is an auxiliary model uh, where the theory is coupled to n fundamental Dirac fermions. They have exactly the same uh, current algebra level. And this implies that the massive spectra are the same in these two models. Uh, and, uh, and this was used as an argument for screening because this is obvious in the model with the fundamentals. Uh, so the, since the massive spectrum is the same, it's, uh, it's really means that the model with the joint is also screening. But now I think we understood a little better how to, uh, that this extends also to the model where you add on both sides a massive quark. Uh, then some meson states in this theory T, which is massive quark plus the joints, I seem to fall apart into states in theory T prime, which is massive quark plus n massless one. And, uh, uh, and we basically again see these threshold states and the appearance of continuous spectrum appearing in the heavy, heavy meson sector. So, so this is, for example, uh, the spectrum. So schematically, you see this type of picture. These are two heavy quarks and somehow they fall apart into heavy, two heavy light states. So, uh, so the masses in this uh, massive uh, work plus massless adjoint model are really showing the structure, the two body structure, the unexpected two body structure. Uh, their exact threshold bound states. And we see from these masses here, some, the blue dots exhibit these exact degeneracies. Uh, shown here. Uh, but the, <clears throat> the final point is that the confinement is really not trivial because uh, this is the picture in the fermionic meson spectrum, namely where you have a, an odd number of uh, adjoints in addition to the quark and the quark. But if you take an even number of adjoints, you see that under this continuum, there is a true bound state. Uh, the bound state was masses below the threshold. Mm -hmm. And this bound state is seen very clearly using this numerical diagonalization. So what is this telling us? It's telling us basically the following, that if you actually look at the quark anti-quark uh, potential that you infer from this, at short distances, it basically has the linear structure. Uh, and this can support one or two bound states at short distances. But then at long distances, due to the effects of these massless adjoints, it levels off exactly. And this is screening. So the threshold will be exactly at this level here, but there can be some states under the threshold. And this is a beautiful illustration how uh, even in this simple model, confinement can disappear because the massless adjoints renormalize the string tension from non-zero value at short distances to a zero value at long distances. And it's very nice that we, we can see this from this numerical scheme very, very clearly. And uh, some indications for this were seen already in the old work by Smilga, by Lance Schiffman and Keith, and also Chairman Jacobson, Tanizaki and Unsal. 
who basically saw that the confinement is not trivial. Uh, it's not just counting the zero modes. You really, you see that something non-trivial is happening as a function of distance. And uh, so more needs to be done to understand all this. So let me just kind of conclude. Uh, so of course we know that throughout its history, string theory has been intertwined with the uh, theory of strong interactions. And the ADS CFT, which is already almost 25 years old, uh, has made some of this connection precise. And there are models where you can see color confinement, but not simultaneously with asymptotic freedom. So more remains to be understood here for sure. Uh, but uh, in 2D gauge theories, one can study things much more precisely, but some of them are still too hard to be exactly solvable. For example, the models with the uh, joint quanta in addition to fundamental ones. And in these models, you see some very interesting transitions between screening and confining behavior as you dial up the mass of the joint. Uh, and uh, in particular, it's a model of very weak confinement if you make the mass of the joint much, much smaller than G and Mills. Uh, this could be a, a very interesting model to study in more detail. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any questions, discussions, comments? Please, may I ask? Please do. Boris, Boris Altshuler. Okay. You know, Hello. thank you. Thank you for your talk. And um, I didn't catch, perhaps I'm stupid enough, as John Wheeler said. You uh, said you received very interesting exact numbers in, in the rather conventional series of uh, quantum, like quantum chromodynamics, that's gauge, gauge theory with fermions or without. But I didn't catch what was your special method that you managed to receive these numbers. Well, for one thing, it's it's a toy model still, right? It's a model in one spatial and one time dimension. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a model. Uh, so so let me just go back to. Uh, so for example, the Toft model, yeah, Toft was the first to get exact numbers in the large end limit of two dimensional PCD. Uh, so the secret is that in one plus one dimensions, the light cone gauge is very powerful. And one can reduce, for example, the meson spectrum to just a single integral equation. It's still not exactly solvable, but one can solve it very precisely numerically. And one gets the masses uh, of, of bound states as a function of the mass of the quark. And basically these states are like vibrational states. You have a quark anti-quark held together by a linear potential and they're just vibrating. Like this. Uh, yeah, it's all, uh, certainly the method that we used also relied on one, one dimension, one spatial dimension. Thank you. Can I, can I have a te technical question, if possible? So I have two technical questions uh, concerning the degeneracy that you mentioned. Uh, the first question, well, well, as far as I understand, uh, this degeneracy referred to some excited states, right? Not to vacuum states. Right, right. But uh, you know that Komargotsky, the paper of Komargotsky, they claim uh, the high degeneracy of vacuum states. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, I think their degeneracy has to do, well, as, as we discussed, uh, we, I don't understand it fully, but that has to do with a bit like uh, non-trivial vacuum structure. But, uh, we are in this light cone calculation, we are working in the trivial vacuum. So, okay, we, so won't see, we won't see their degeneracy at all. That, that's the drawback of the, of the light cone approach, right? In the light cone approach, like even Witten's uh, vacua, right, which have been known since times immemorial, and you worked on them a lot. Oops, I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, yeah, Witten's vacua, where you just put a quark and an antiquark at infinity, or two quarks and two antiquarks at infinity. 
I would say we are working in the trivial sector k equals zero where there is nothing at infinity. Because uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, and the second question, uh, is it true that you can uh, see this degeneracy in uh, the large NC limit? Uh, I think we actually it. found, this is not in our paper, but there are even some degeneracies at finite n as well, at the ones that we see. Uh, how can you uh, build, uh, make a Well, we, did, we also say. did some calculations at finite and we haven't published them yet, but, uh, but the large end for sure, we see these exact degeneracies. As I mentioned, uh, some of them were already seen in this little paper that I wrote with my student, uh, Aki Hashimoto. Actually, he was a postdoc already and David Gross. Uh, you see this peculiar structure that the mass square, the P minus of, of a single trace meson is a sum of P minuses at other values of this P plus. The, the, this equation we really observed back then and we didn't fully understand where it came from, but I think it comes from this, what Kutasa and Schwimmer pointed out right around the same time, which is that uh, that there is, if you, there is a way to organize states into these uh, cuts moody blocks or current algebra blocks. And the different blocks don't mix with each other. So that's what we explained rather clearly in our paper, hopefully in our new paper, where this degeneracy comes from. Uh, it's a degeneracy seen in the cutoff theory. You don't need to take K to infinity. It's just the, for, the degeneracy seen in this DLCQ approach. Uh, for example, numerically here, you can see that there are lots of uh, these, um, these dots that are exactly degenerate. Every blue dot is exact, exhibiting exactly degenerate structure with some uh, other states. And this is for us, so while the, the theory at finite cutoff is not in itself telling us anything about the continuum limit, it already contains the degeneracy. So if you extrapolate this pattern, you can see very clearly that the theory is, uh, has continuous spectrum. And the threshold for continuous spectrum is here. It's at 8.01 with our numerical distribution. Okay, thank you. I haven't understood everything, but probably I will uh, ask you later privately. Sure. sure. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Can I just make a comment? I mean, actually, we have a discussion session after the last talk of this session, so it would probably make sense to, to go into more detail if um, possible, okay. just to keep on the schedule. At yeah. the moment. Okay. So uh, let's then go on to the next talk, and th then we will um, uh, have a larger discussion session afterwards. Okay.